I'm looking at a painting, one of many depicting the storming of Badajoz, that imposing Spanish city with huge walls that defends the southern route between Spain and Portugal. This image has really caught my eye. In it, a line of redcoats struggles towards the top of the breach, climbing and crawling up the debris that slopes upwards into the thick, swirling smoke at the top. Dead and wounded men litter the narrow pathway. French soldiers like shadowy apparitions line the top of the breach. Muskets drawn. Near the bottom of the painting, an officer raises his left hand, gesturing for the men behind him to follow. A quick Google search reveals that this is Lieutenant Colonel McLeod leading the 43rd Light Infantry. He, like many of his men, was killed during the assault. It's a powerful and atmospheric image. The storming of Badajoz during the Third British Siege is brutal and gruesome. It's the battle that triggered my initial interest in learning about the Peninsula War. Reading the novel Sharp's Company, I became fascinated by the horror of the fight in the breaches and then shocked by the tales of the horrific sack of the city that followed. Rain, rain and mud. On the night of the 17th of March, the wet and shivering British soldiers began digging the trenches which were known as parallels that would allow them to get within cannon shot of the walls. Grattan describes the event. The evening of the 17th of March had scarcely closed when 3,000 men broke ground before La Picarina. That's the fort on the outside of the main walls, southeast of the city, if you remember, at a distance of 150 yards. The night was unusually dark, the wind was high and the rain fell in torrents, all of which favoured the enterprise. The soldiers, accustomed to fatigues and knowing by experience, if for nothing but their own safety, the necessity of getting on rapidly with their work, exerted themselves to the utmost. And when the grey dawn of morning made its appearance, the enemy beheld with surprise, through the mist that surrounded them, the first parallel of our work completed. On the 25th of March, with the weather finally beginning to improve, the British guns were now in place and able to commence the bombardments of the fort. That same night, Wellington ordered Fort Picarina to be assaulted. Fort Picarina was essentially a, a detached bastion defended by 300 men with seven light guns. It had ditches in its front and its ramparts were protected by sharp stakes. At the rear was a triple row of palisades. The fort's capture would be an important step in Wellington's plan to take the city. Grattan, our favourite author, picks up the story. At half past seven o'clock, the storming party, consisting of 15 officers and 500 privates, stood to their arms. General Kempt, who commanded in, the, commanded in the trenches, explained to them the duty they had to perform. He did so in his usual clear manner and everyone knew what part he was to fill, fulfil. The great cathedral bell of the city at length toiled the hour of eight and its last sounds had scarcely died away when the signal from the battery summoned the men to their perilous task. The three detachments sprang out of the works at the same time and ran forward to the glasses. One hundred men fell before they even reached the outer work, but the rest, undismayed by the loss and unshaken in their purpose, threw themselves into the ditch or against the palisades at the gorge. The sappers, armed with axes and crowbars, attempted to cut away or force down this defence, but the palisades were of such thickness and so firmly placed in the ground that before any impression could be made, nearly all the men who had crowded to this point were struck dead. The time was passing rapidly and had been awfully occupied by the enemy while as yet our troops had not made any progress that would warrant a hope of success. More than two-thirds of the officers and privates were killed or wounded. It was really a desperate situation, and it looked like the assault was about to fail miserably. General Kempt, running out of options, threw his last remaining reserves into the attack, and finally, through applying pressure at multiple points simultaneously, the French defenders began to give way. Grattan, again, says that never from the commencement of the war until its termination was there a more gallant exploit than the storming of this outwork. Big words, that was a guy who was at a lot of major battles. From the captured fort, the British trenches now began to extend and new artillery batteries were installed closer to the city walls. Slowly but surely, 
the artillery chipped away at the defences until three breaches were made. As always, time was against Wellington. He needed to storm the city before Marshal Soult could try and relieve it again. On the 6th of April 1812, the order was given to attack. The plan was for a number of simultaneous assaults to be launched at 10pm. The 4th and Light Divisions would attack the main breaches. When the breaches were carried, the Light Division was to wheel to the left, the 4th to the right, and to sweep along the neighbouring bastions on each side. Meanwhile, Picton's 3rd Division was to escalade the high walls of the castle. In other words, to try and climb up them using ladders. Picton's hope was that the castle was such a strong defensive position that the attempt may catch the defenders by surprise. It was a very risky assumption. A number of other smaller diversionary attacks were also planned. The lunette at San Roque was to be attacked. The Portuguese were to assault Fort Pardaleras, while one of the British brigades in Leif's 5th Division was to try and escalade the bastion of San Vicente. These attacks, though, were considered unlikely to succeed. Overall, nearly 20,000 men would be involved in the attack on the city. It was hoped that weight of numbers would be enough to ensure success. As soon as the daylight began to fade, the troops moved through the mist and took up their allocated positions. There was an air of grim determination, the men desperate to be rewarded for what had been an exhausting and deadly siege. Sergeant William Lawrence of the 40th Regiment of Foot gives a sense of the mindset of the men when he wrote, I will relate an engagement that myself, Pig Harding, and another of my comrades, George Bowden by name, entered into before we even started on our way. Bit of a funny accent, bear with me. Of which the result showed what a blind one it was. Through being quartered at Badahoff after the Battle of Talavera, all three of us knew the town perfectly well, and so understood the position of most of the valuable shops. And hearing a report likewise that if we succeeded in taking the place, there was to be three hours plunder. We had planned to meet at a silversmith's shop that we knew about. Poor Pig even providing himself with a piece of wax candle to light us if needed. That shows that the men were already looking forward to robbing. As we move into the final assault, I think it's worth quoting some of the accounts at length to really understand the true horror. Rifleman Costello had volunteered for the Forlorn Hope of the Light Division. The Forlorn Hope were volunteers who would attack the breaches first and face the greatest danger. He wrote, The word was now given to the ladder party to move forward. We were accompanied at each side by two men with hatchets to cut down any obstacle that might oppose them. There were six of us supporting the ladder allotted to me. We had proceeded but a short distance when we heard the sound of voices on our right upon which we halted and supposing they might be enemies. I disengaged myself from the ladder and cocking my rifle prepared for action. Luckily we soon discovered our mistake as one of our party cried Take care, tis the stormers of the 4th Division coming to join us. This proved to be the case. The brief alarm over we continued advancing towards the walls. The rifles as before keeping in front. We had to pass Fort San Roche, or San Roque, I'm not sure which he means, on our left near to the town. And as we approached it, the French sentry challenged. This was instantly followed by a shot from the fort and another from the walls of the town. A moment afterwards, a fireball was thrown out, which threw a bright red glare of light around us. And instantly, a volley of grape shot, canister and small arms poured in amongst us. At a distance of about 30 yards from the walls, three of the men carrying the ladder with me were shot dead in a breath, and its weight falling upon me I fell backward. The remainder of the stormers rushed up, regardless of my cries or those of the wounded men around me, for by this time our men were falling fast. Many in passing were shot and fell upon me, so that I was actually drenched in blood. At length, by a strong effort, I managed to extricate myself, in doing which I left my rifle behind me and, drawing my sword, rushed towards the breach. There I found four men putting a ladder down the ditch and, not daring to pause, fresh lights being still thrown out of the town with a continual discharge of musketry, I slid quickly down the ladder. But before I could recover my footing, was knocked down again by the bodies of men who were shot in attempting the descent. I, however, succeeded in extricating myself from underneath the dead and rushing forward to the right. To my surprise and fear, I found myself nearly up to my neck in water. Horrifying, isn't it? 
Until then, I was tolerably composed, but now all reflection left me, and diving through the water, being a good swimmer, I attempted to make it to the breach. In doing this, I lost my sword. Without rifle, sword, or any other weapon, I succeeded in clambering up a part of the breach and came near to a chevaux de frise, consisting of a piece of heavy timber studded with sword blades turning on an axis. But just before reaching it, I received a stroke on the breast, whether from a grenade or a stone or by the butt end of a musket, I cannot say. But down I rolled, senseless, and drenched with water and human gore. I could not have laid long in this plight, for when my senses had, in some measure, returned, I perceived our gallant fellows still rushing forward, each seeming to share a fate more deadly than my own. The fire continued in one horrible and incessant peal, as if the mouth of the infernal regions had opened to vomit forth destruction upon all of us. End quote. William Lawrence was also with a forlorn hope, that one of the 4th Division, and his plans for robbing the city's silver shop were soon abandoned. Here he is again. I was one of the latter party, for we did not feel inclined to trust the Portuguese as we did at Theodad Rodrigo. On our arriving at the breach, the French sentry on the wall cried out, Who comes there? Three times, or, or words to that effect in his own language. But on no answer being given, a shower of shot, canister and grape, together with fireballs, was hurled at random amongst us. Poor Pig received his death wound immediately, and my other accomplice, Bowden, became missing, while I myself received two small slug shots in my left knee and a musket shot in my right side, which must have been mortal had it not been for my canteen, for the ball penetrated that and passed out, making two holes in it, and then entered my side slightly. Still I stuck to my ladder and got into the entrenchment. Numbers had by this time fallen, but the cry from our commanders being, Come on, my lads! We hastened to the breach, but there, to our great surprise and discouragement, we found a chevaux de frise had been fixed, and a deep entrenchment made from behind which the garrison opened a deadly fire on us. Vain attempts were made to remove this fearful obstacle, during which my left hand was dreadfully cut by one of the blades on the chevaux de frise, but finding no success in that quarter we were forced to retire for a time. We remained, however, in the breach until we were quite weary with our efforts to pass it, my wounds were still bleeding and I began to feel weak. My comrades persuaded me to go to the rear, but this proved a task of great difficulty, for on arriving at the ladders I found them filled with the dead and wounded, hanging, some by their feet, just as they had fallen. I hove down three lots of them, hearing the implorings of the wounded all the time. But on coming to the fourth I found it completely smothered with dead bodies, so I had to draw myself up over them as best as I could. When I arrived at the top, I almost wished myself back again, for there of the two I think was the worst sight, nothing but the dead and wounded, lying around, and the cries of the latter, mingled with the incessant firing from the enemy, being quite deafening. I was so weak myself that I could scarcely walk, so I crawled on my hands and knees till I got out of reach of the enemy's musketry. So the attacks against the main breaches were grinding to a bloody standstill. The French, expecting the attack here, had made the position almost impregnable. The breach was an obstacle course of upturned carts, broken boats, spikes hammered into wooden beams, and of course those awful chevaux de frise, and their spinning sword blades, which both of the above accounts mention. To cap it all, the French had laid mines in the breaches. As the historian Charles Oman says, The light division descended into the ditch further to the left, towards Santa Maria. Many men were already at the bottom, the rest crowded on the edge, where the French engineers fired the series of mines and powder barrels which had been laid in the ditch. They worked perfectly, and the result was appalling. The 500 volunteers who formed the advance of each division were almost all slain, scorched or disabled. Every one of the engineer officers set to guide the column was killed or wounded, and the want of direction caused by the absence of anyone who knew the topography of the breaches had the most serious effect during the rest of the storm. Of the light division officers with the, the advance, only two escaped unhurt. The assault against the main breaches was a bloody failure. Meanwhile, the third division, slightly ahead of schedule, began its attack on the castle. There was a solemn but confident mood amongst the men. They looked like pirates with their shirts unbuttoned, their trousers rolled up to the knee and their knapsacks left behind. Our old friend Grattan, of course, of the 88th Connaught Rangers, takes up the story. 
The division now moved forward in one solid mass. Solid mass. Their advance was undisturbed until they reached the Riveas, the stream. But at this spot, some fireballs which the enemy threw out caused a great light and the 3rd Division, 3,000 strong, was to be seen from the ramparts of the castle. Finding they were discovered, they raised a shout of defiance which was responded to by the garrison. And in a moment afterwards, every gun that could be brought to bear against them was in action. But no way daunted by the havoc made in his ranks, Picton, who just then joined his soldiers, forded the Riveas knee-deep and soon gained the foot of the castle wall. And here he saw the work was, that was cut out for him. A host of French veterans crowned the wall, all armed in a manner as imposing as novel. Each man had beside him eight loaded firelocks while at intervals were pikes of an enormous length with crooks attached to them for the purpose of grappling with the ladders. The top of the wall was covered with rocks of ponderous size, only requiring a slight push to hurl them upon the heads of our soldiers, and there was a sufficiency of hand grenades and small shells at the disposal of the men that defended this point. Things didn't look promising. Picton was quickly wounded in the groin, and command devolved to his senior brigade commander, General Kemp. All was confusion and horror as the ladders were delayed, forcing the men to stand helpless under the walls while they were brought forward. When they did arrive, the men clambered up them, only for them to be pushed over or to break. All hopes depended on the last ladder. A private of the 45th Nottinghams was the first to scramble up it. He reached the parapet, but he was quickly shot and fell backwards, tumbling 30 feet to the ground. The next man, Corporal Michael Kelly, sprang over and shot the nearest defender. The British were in. The French commander, General Philippon, had not expected the attack on the castle, and so most of its defenders had been moved towards the main breaches. That mistake now became apparent as the British flooded over the walls. A gutter fight raged in the stairwells and many of the defenders were caught and bayoneted. By midnight, the fight for the castle was over, but the noise didn't abate as the men, many of them now becoming drunk, began rampaging through the castle, firing wildly and looking for booty amongst the mass of French provisions which had been gathered within its high walls. Meanwhile, the capture of the castle wasn't the only British success. The other diversionary attacks were now proving to be successful. The lunette at San Roque was captured and then, against all expectations, the 5th Division, attacking an hour behind schedule due to a mix-up with their ladders, managed to climb up them and capture the remote river bastion of San Vicente. From here, they battled their way along the walls until the French soldiers at the breaches suddenly found themselves under fire from the rear. They were forced to surrender. The fighting, amongst the most harrowing ever experienced by British troops, was now as good as over. They'd done it. Given the horror at the main breaches and the strength of the city walls, no one could have been happier to hear the news than Wellington, who had been fearing the worst. Shortly afterwards, he wrote to Lord Liverpool, the Secretary for War. He said, the capture of Badahoff affords an, a strong an instance of the gallantry, gallantry of our troops as has ever been displayed, but I greatly hope that I shall never again be the instrument of putting them to such a test as they were put to last night. I assure your lordship that it is quite impossible to carry fortified places by force without incurring grave loss and being exposed to the chance of failure.' 